Anybody know how to change a light bulb and, and a projector? That was a good setup. gates with thanksgiving this morning let's stand and worship let's kick us off hey this is a new song straight from elevation welcome if you're joining us at home let's just enter into worship you guys ready here we go bring it up i give you glory for all you brought me through now i'm Whatever you wanna do, let's sing that again. I give you glory. Put your hands together. Give you glory. Come on. For all you brought me through. Now I'm ready for whatever you wanna do. I think you got it now. Let's sing it again. Here we go. I give you glory. Yeah. For all you brought me through. And now I'm. sing that chorus.
surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemy till all my fears are gone.
child of God. Good morning, Bergen Park Church. My name is Steve. Let's pray. Father, you are worthy. You are magnificent. You are glorious. You are our comforter. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are our healer. We call you friend. You are our Abba, our provider, our comforter. You are everything we need. And you love to lavish who you are on us. Day in, day out, night, doesn't matter. Week in, week out. It's who you are. And so we say thank you, Father. Thank you for, your, for who you are, for lavishing your love on us, for your protection over us. We thank you for your protection, Lord Jesus, for your protection over every person at Bergen Park Church. We thank you that you heal us. We thank you that you love us, you provide for us. We give you and you alone all honor, all glory, all praise. You are magnificent. You are wonderful. We are so thankful that we can worship you today in this place in spirit and in truth. And we don't take that lightly. We say thank you, Father. Thank you that we can come on this beautiful Sunday and sing praises to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Once is a gentle. 
Heavenly Father, we just want to come before you and acknowledge your presence. We want to acknowledge the identity we have in you is born again, chosen, beloved. Help us walk in that identity. Help us walk in that truth. Help us remind us of that every day, who we truly are. We're set apart. We just ask you to be with us as Jonah brings the word and just opens up the scriptures. Um, we're ready to receive. Um, keep our minds alert and focused on you. We just thank you for your goodness, your mercy. Help us remind us that all good things come from above, come from you. So we ask all these things. Everybody said, amen. Morning, Bergen Park Church. I want to remind you too, if you're more comfortable removing your mask during the sermon, feel free to do that. Uh, we just ask that you keep it on during the fellowship time. I also want to encourage us to be reaching out to people as much as possible during this time. Um, I think we need to really try to maintain fellowship as much as possible. There are probably a lot of people you know, friends or acquaintances from the church that could use a phone call or maybe even a face-to-face, -face, of course, with a social distancing thing in place. But um, I'd encourage you this week to, to think of some people that could use some, some encouragement and continue to reach out. Um, over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've been looking at the theme of being renewed in God's Word and what that looks like, to be renewed in the Word of God. So last week, we were in Psalm 1, and we were looking at this, this idea of meditation on God's word. So we looked at the man who is blessed by God, the one who is blessed by God, who walks in the ways of God, not in the ways of wickedness. He's the one who meditates on God's word, who delights in the word of God. He's like a tree planted by streams of water who bears fruit, right? So that was the idea, the one who's attached to God's word, who ponders God's word. And so I want to follow up on some of those themes uh, today as well. So we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 22. And in 2 Kings 22, we meet a king named Josiah, king of Judah. And we're going to hear about his encounter with God's word and how the word of God really transformed his life and the lives of the people of Judah. Now, the reason this is important to be thinking about is that we live in a society right now uh, we're really, we're inundated with a lot of media, a lot of information, a lot of news, and it's not always the most edifying thing to be listening to. There's a lot of hatred, a lot of anger, a lot of discord in our culture right now. We live in the information age, right? That means easy access to innumerable resources. A lot of those are very good resources. But it also means that we're in inundated, as I said, with incessant noise, most of which amounts to little more than a mass of vacuous locutions hardly worth a second thought, All right? Most news isn't really news. Much of the media we absorb is comprised of insipid acoustic uh, disruption. That's really what it amounts to. Now, what this tells us is that some information really needs to be ignored. It needs to be ignored. Other information, however, should elicit a response on our part, some sort of reaction. Unfortunately, when it comes to the most important questions concerning life and death, God and man, heaven, hell, those kinds of things, we're not always listening to the right information. So my question for us today is this, what response does the Bible elicit or provoke in us? What response does God's word incite in us? Does the Bible guide us and inform us in every part of our life, 
as it directs us into a life of discipleship, or is it just another book, like any other book on our shelves? So like I said, we're going to be looking today at the life of King Josiah, King of Judah, and his encounter with the Word of God. And really what he discovered is that the Word of God is a valuable treasure. So let's go to 2 Kings chapter 22, and I'll read verses 1 through 13. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. In the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, son of Meshulam, the secretary, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may count the money that has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the threshold have collected from the people. And let it be given into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the workmen who are at the house of the Lord, repairing the house. That is, to the carpenters, to the builders, And to the masons, and let them use it for buying timber and quarried stone to repair the house. But no accounting shall be asked from them for the money that is delivered into their hand, for they deal honestly. And Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it to the hand of the workmen who have oversight of the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and Akbor, the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan, the secretary, and Asiah, the king's servant, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that have been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray before we go any further with our study. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would let us store up your word in our heart. We ask, Lord, that you would allow us to treasure your word today. Let it wash over us. Let it transform us. Let it instruct us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I need to give you a little bit of uh, background and context on what we're reading here because we're jumping right into the end of Second Kings. There's really no context. We haven't been working our way through this book. So just to help you understand what's going on here, the books of First and Second Kings give us a history of the kings of Israel from the time of David to the time of the Babylonian captivity. So if you read the narrative from beginning to end, basically what you're going to see is a very long, slow decline of the people of Israel and the people of Judah to the point where they are eventually judged by God. So after David, we have his son Solomon who becomes king. And because of Solomon's sin, God tells him essentially the the kingdom will be torn away from him. Um, It won't happen during his lifetime, but in the lifetime of his son. So then we come to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, and at that time we see the split between Judah and Israel. So Israel comprises uh, the ten tribes that were located in the north of Israel, and then Judah was the southern tribe. This would be where Jerusalem is located. So you have Judah in the south, Israel in the north, and then basically we're just following these kings. And you'll see something in the text over and over again is, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. This was the trend that we would see among the kings of the north of Israel. And essentially that led to God judging the, the Israelites by sending the Assyrians to come and conquer that, that land. Now Judah hung on for a few more years, about 130 years more. 
Um, but we do read that there were some good kings in Judah, and Josiah is one of those kings. Now, keep in mind as well that the success of God's people as a nation in the Old Testament is inextricably linked to their love of God and their obedience to his word. Okay, so ancient Israel is historically unique as a nation state in that God has made a covenant with this particular nation nation so that if they obey him, they're blessed. If they disobey him, they're cursed. And you can read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 28, where you'll see a long list of blessings if the people obey. And their trees will bear fruit, their crops, they'll have a good harvest, they will defeat their enemies in battle, they'll live in peace, that kind of thing. But if they sin against God, then there are a long list of curses. So that's the context. No other nation at that time or since has enjoyed that kind of status with God. So with this context in mind, we turn to King Josiah and to his encounter with God's word, which led to a dr- really a dramatic response on his part. In fact, King Josiah's response to the word should really incite in us to ask ourselves how we as a church should respond to God's word. So the first important feature of this passage is that the word of God is a valuable treasure, a valuable treasure. So the narrative of of 2 Kings 22 builds in a really interesting way. Notice that it isn't the discovery of the book of the law that serves as the climax of this portion of Scripture in verse 8. It's not the discovery of the book that serves as the climax. Rather, it's the reading of the book of the law that serves as the climax of this chapter. That's the part that gets our attention. Now, the content... And this is important because the content is more important than the object. That's something we need to to think about. It's not the object itself, it's the words, it's what is transmitted through the object that serve as something important. Now, if you've gone to a museum, if you've seen one of these Gutenberg Bibles, the very first Bibles or books printed on a a printing press, these things are beautiful, right? The the leather, the binding, the the, the ink itself, the art artistry of the, uh, of the assembly of the whole thing, I and mean, the book itself is a valuable treasure. But again, what we want to focus on is not just the object, right, but the contents. So we are told that Josiah has done what is right in the eyes of the Lord. We read that right away at the beginning of the passage. He's a good king, and though we don't know much about his life up to this point, we do know that he has commissioned repairs to the temple. So apparently he's taking things seriously enough He wants to restore the temple that's fallen into disrepair. And so he sends his servant to instruct Hilkiah, or Hilkiah, the high priest, to oversee these these reparations to the temple. And I imagine as the workmen are are working in the back of the temple somewhere, they see this, maybe this old wooden box. The lid might be slightly ajar, so they call over Hilkiah, the priest, to investigate He wipes away a layer of dust, he pries back the lid, and reaches in, and out comes a book, or more accurately, a scroll. As he peels the paper back, he begins to read, and he sees these words. It says, these are the words that Moses spoke to Israel. He realizes he's discovered the book of the law, that is the book of Deuteronomy. Now, most scholars believe that when we see in in the singular book of the law, it's referring specifically to the book of Deuteronomy. Okay, now it's possible that what he discovered here was the Pentateuch. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But at bare minimum, he's discovered the book of Deuteronomy. So he brings this book to Josiah. Now, the funny thing is, the book was hiding in plain sight. It was exactly where it was supposed to be. Because if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 26, Moses was instructed by God to place the book of the law in the tabernacle or temple right next to the the, the Ark of the Covenant. It was exactly where it was supposed to be. This shouldn't have been a shocking thing. So this tells us something about where the nation had gone, where these people were. They had forgotten God's word. Now, this happens sometimes. I was reading recently um, about somebody who had sold a Picasso, an original Picasso painting on a garage sale for something like $5. It turned out to be worth thousands. This happens every once in a while. We, we might have a treasure in our attic, in our, 
our basement and our garage, something that's worth a lot of money. Sometimes treasures are hiding in plain sight, and that's really the situation here. This treasure, this valuable book of the law was hiding in plain sight in the temple. And in the same way, God's word is a treasure, right? This is why we read in Psalm 119, verse 11, the psalmist says that he has treasured the words of God in his heart. You'd only say this if the thing has great value to you. God's word has great value. So that's the first point. God's word is a valuable treasure. But the word of God was not just a treasure to be displayed in a museum or admired for its literary or artistic value. It wasn't just another book to throw up on the shelf next to the works of history and philosophy and, and those kinds of things. No, this was a book to be read and truly savored. This was a life-transforming book. And so my second point here is that the word of God should convict our hearts. It should convict our hearts. Now, when Josiah saw the books of the law, or this book of the law, he asked that it be read to him aloud. So he, he sat on his royal throne, and he began to hear the story of God's people, how God had called Abraham out of a foreign land to follow him in obedience and faith. He read about God's covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. He read about the bondage in Egypt. He read about how God had delivered his people. He read about the, the, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. He read all of these laws, all of these works of God, the things that God had done for his people, and this touched his heart. He couldn't remain silent. His heart was convicted. He was compelled to act. He couldn't remain neutral in the face of God's word. Now imagine that you're taking a cruise on a, a, a cruise ship, maybe in the Mediterranean, right? It's a beautiful sea around you, beautiful uh, sunshine. Uh, you're laying on the deck of the, the ship, the, the breeze is blowing across your skin, you're enjoying the sunshine, and suddenly you hear the captain of the ship yell out over the loudspeaker that the ship is going down. It, 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 you've hit a rock or an iceberg, or uh, maybe not an iceberg in the Mediterranean, but you've hit something. <laughs> the ship is going down, right? So you, at this point, have to make a decision. Do I, do I lay here and continue sipping my pina colada and enjoying the beautiful sunshine, or do I get up and, and respond? You see, either way, you can't stay neutral. You can't remain neutral when you're faced with this kind of news. The situation is critical. You have to act. And in the same way, we see that the word of God provoked a drastic response in the king. Right? He didn't just ignore it. He didn't wait until later to respond. We read that he gets up and he tears his robe. Right? This was an expression in ancient times of extreme grief, of sadness, of remorse, of regret of suffering, the word had convicted his heart. Josiah knew that his sin and the sin of his fathers was grievous. Josiah's response was extreme because the sin of the people had been extreme. And in the preceding chapter, if you go back and read chapter 21, and I would encourage you to do that uh, this week, read more of this context, maybe chapter 21 through 23, and kind of see how this story unfolds. But if you go back to chapter 21 of 2 Kings, you'll meet Josiah's grandfather, Manasseh. He was considered to be the worst king that Judah had ever had. Okay, he was a violent man. He was a murderer of his own people. Okay, he had abandoned God and worshipped the detestable gods of the Canaanites. He had sacrificed one of his own sons into the fires of the false god Molech. Just to give you an idea of how detestable things had become in Judah. He had transformed the temple of the holy God into a temple of doom. He'd filled the holy place with idols. So by the time Josiah has become king, Judah was already essentially a sewage dump of wickedness, of unrighteousness. This extreme sin provoked an extreme reaction on the part of Josiah. His heart was convicted. He saw what his fathers had done. But Josiah didn't just sit and weep over his sin. He got up and he repented he started to follow God even more. This is the third point. You see, the word of God elicits a reaction in us. Now, if we can weep over our sin condition, we've, we've done well. 
But if we stop there, we've only understood half the story, right? The next piece is to ask ourselves, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to walk in a life of discipleship with my God? Notice in the text that Josiah didn't try to justify his his idolatry or the sin of his people. He didn't try to make excuses for their sin. Yet this is what so many of us do. We hear the word, and then we simply walk away. We shrug and say, well, that doesn't apply to me. That couldn't apply to me. We end up becoming practical atheists, right, who acknowledge God with our heads, and yet we deny him with our hearts. So here's what we need to understand, that for the people of Israel, a healthy nation was a God-centered nation. A God-centered nation was a word-centered nation. Now, what does that mean for us today? Now, it means that we need to appreciate the shift from God's people as as a nation state under the old covenant to God's people as a church under the new covenant. What that means is that a healthy church needs to be a God-centered church. And a God-centered church is a word-centered church. So I want to ask us to pay attention to several things. First, a, a healthy church is a church whose theology and whose mission is rooted in God's word. So what God says about himself in the Bible should always supersede what man says about God. This means that what we say about God should flow naturally from what God has revealed about himself in Scripture. So when we preach, when we teach, when we gather for small groups, when we pray, when we worship, God's word must direct our thoughts about God. Secondly, a healthy church fills itself with God's word, right? Meditating on God's word requires being filled with the things of God. The difference between Christian faith and, say, Eastern uh, pantheistic and non-dualistic philosophies is that in the Christian faith, when we talk about meditating on God's Word, we're filling ourselves with the Word. We're memorizing it. We're pondering it. We're reading it again and again. We're praying through it. We're filling ourselves with the Word. Whereas in a lot of Eastern thinking, when we talk about meditation, the idea is to empty the mind, to empty the self. That's not what God asks us to do. He calls us to be filled with the word. A third thing to consider, a healthy church seeks to build their belief and practice around a careful, thoughtful, and prayerful hermeneutic or interpretation of the Bible. Okay, we see that when Josiah gets up, if you continue to read this chapter, you'll see that he sends his servants to go consult a prophetess, a woman in Jerusalem who knew how to interpret this and to instruct the people. So he, he wants the right interpretation. Josiah was looking for the right information here. Now, when we impose modern philosophical or literary theory on the Bible, its message is inevitably diminished. Right? When we impose modern scientific paradigms on the Bible, its message is going to be diminished. When we read the Bible through the lens of 21st century political theory, its message is diminished. Theologies that attempt to overly humanize the Bible or that attempt to undermine its divine origin and, and the author's original atent- intent end up diminishing God's sovereignty It diminishes what God says about the gravity of the human condition. It diminishes what God says about justification by faith in Christ alone. Now, I've read a lot of theological books in my lifetime, if you can believe that. And one thing that that all the bad ones have in common is an author who diminishes the authority of God's word every single time. That's one thing you will always see in common with the bad theological books. We need to uphold the authority of God's word. So the final concern really uh, ties into what I just said, and, and this is drawn from verse 13. The wrath of God is kindled against us because we haven't obeyed the words of this book. These are Josiah's words when he's confronted with God's word. A healthy church recognizes the authority of God and its transmission in the word. 
According to theologian Gavin Ortland, upholding biblical authority ensures that we remain the judged rather than the judges of God and the truth. God is the authority, right? So my question is this as we close. Do we need to rediscover the treasury of God's word? What reaction is elicited in us when we read of God's grace and the reconciliation of God and man by way of the righteousness of Christ? How will we respond to God's judgment? How will we respond to God's grace? You see, the Bible is the most important book we will ever read, not because it's just a manual for living life in a better way. No, the Bible is the most important book we will ever read because it tells us who God is. It shows us how to worship God. It explains what God has done to bring about redemption through Jesus Christ. So what response does the Bible provoke in us when we read it? Are we ready to throw ourselves down in repentance and worship? Are we ready to metaphorically tear our robes over the sin that we've committed against God? To humble ourselves, to come before him in repentance to recognize his overwhelming love for each and every one of us. You see, God wants us to rediscover the wonders of his word each and every day, All right? To wake up every morning, to look at that Bible on our bedstand, and to say, wow, I found a book. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word, the message of your word, Lord, your wrath against sin was satisfied in Christ. Your love for us was demonstrated in Christ. Your grace and your mercy has been promised in the word, in scriptures, and fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. Lord, we ask that you would empower us today to live in the truth of your word and to treasure the cross of Christ. We know you've spoken, Lord. Help us to listen. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is a song I wrote um, a couple of months ago, and uh, we did it once before. Um, So we're going to close with this. It's a hymn called I'll Listen For You. Just about listening to hear and understand God's word and God's will for our lives and recognizing his sovereignty.
give you a blessing from Ephesians chapter 3 to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we hope or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen.